Before we start, we want to tell you about New Scientist Flash Halloween Sale, giving you an extra 20% off subscriptions to our print magazine and unlimited access to our website and app. As you'll know from our podcast, the New Scientist team uses rationality, evidence, and clear thinking to combat misinformation and examine the universe with confidence and optimism. That's right. And this extra 20% off offer is available worldwide until the 31st of October. So be quick. Visit newscientist.com slash Halloween22 to take advantage of it. We'll put a link to that great offer in our show notes. Hello and welcome to New Scientist Weekly, the podcast that feeds your curiosity with a curated selection of the essential science stories of the week. I'm Penny Sarche. And I'm Chelsea White. This week, we're getting ready for the next crucial climate summit, COP27, and we're learning about a new quantum way of measuring time and hearing about liver damage that's been associated with a popular supplement. We've also got this. (laughs) (laughs) What was that? I I honestly don't know, but we'll be finding out later, as well as celebrating a life form of the week that is especially appropriate for Halloween. Joining us to talk about all that are New Scientist journalists Michael LePage and Sam Wong in London and Leah Crane in Chicago. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. Okay, let's start with the really serious stuff then. Quite unbelievably, it's been a year since the last big global climate summit, COP26, took place in Glasgow, and its follow-up, COP27, is set to begin in Egypt on the 6th of November. Now, Michael, you've written our magazine cover feature this week, all about where we now stand and what's left to fight for. Could you begin by explaining for us what this next summit is all about and, and what we can sort of hope to expect from it? Yeah, so to start at the beginning, COP27 is the latest in this long line of UN climate conferences aiming to get countries to take action to tackle climate change. So arguably the most important of those was COP21 in Paris in 2015, where countries agreed to try to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial temperature. But, and this is a really big but, under the Paris Agreement, it was up to individual countries to decide what they would do to achieve this. And as is quite well known now, countries haven't yet volunteered to do nearly enough to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. No, there's this yawning gap between the aim and the actions. I have to say I came away from Paris thinking it was basically a greenwashing exercise, a way for politicians to carry on business as usual while appearing to do something. But to be fair, the gap has actually closed somewhat since then. Okay, so when you say it's closed somewhat, can we say by how much? Yes, well, there's a group called Climate Action Tracker that estimates that before the Paris Agreement, we were heading for around 3.6 degrees of warming by 2100. And they say the policies now in place uh, would lead to warming of about 2.7 degrees by 2100. Though, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty about these numbers. Sure, but I mean, that sounds like good news. We're heading for around a degree less of warming than we were. Um, and Every fraction of degree will make a difference, right? It it does, absolutely. But uh, I guess this uh, all depends on whether you see the glass as half full or half empty. Uh, So there has been substantial progress, but 2.7 degrees of warming is still a lot more than 1.5. Anyway, so at last year's summit, uh, countries agreed to come up with more ambitious plans for action ahead of this year's summit. So, of course, the big question now is, is, did they? Uh, no, unfortunately. Uh, so only 20 or so countries have submitted updated plans and hardly any of these were actually any more ambitious. And so, you know, given that most of the important stuff happens before these big climate meetings take place, not actually at the meetings themselves, I think it's pretty clear we're not going to see a big breakthrough on, on emissions cuts at COP27. Is there anything else we can sort of hope for or look for at this summit then? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of other things that people will be talking about. And in particular, we may see some progress on areas such as providing more money to help poorer countries limit their emissions and adapt to cope with a warmer world. Why has there been so little progress since Glasgow? Well, there's the usual foot dragging and denial, of course. But in this this year, we've also got the cost of living crisis hitting many countries hard. That's both distracting leaders and it's also led to this mad dash for fossil fuels to replace those lost Russian supplies. Wow, it's all pretty bleak. Well, in, in the short term it is. The, re- the reaction uh, to the energy crisis is definitely bad in the short term. But actually in the longer term, it, it could be really great news because renewables have become the cheapest and most reliable source of energy we've got. By reliable, I mean they don't run out or get cut off by mad dictators. And I think 
people are only starting to sort of understand that slowly, but the energy crisis is making at least some leaders wake up to this new reality. And that could really speed up the energy transition in the sort of the longer term. I really hope that turns out to be the case. Thanks, Michael. And as I mentioned, Michael's written a great feature article all about the positives that could come out of COP27. Look out for it in this week's magazine, in Shops Now, and we'll put a link to that in our show notes as well. Now it's time for something completely different. Uh, Was that it? (laughs) Oh, no. <laughs> so Sam, what is this story? <laughs> so this is all about animal vocalizations. So obviously we know lots of animals use their voices to communicate, like uh, birds, lots of mammals, obviously, and uh, frogs, for example. But we there are lots of animals that we assumed were silent, like turtles, and it turns out that that isn't the case. <laughs> so how did we find that out? Well, there was a study by Gabriel George Rich Cohen at the University of Zurich and his colleagues, and they recorded sounds from 50 species of turtle. Uh, would you like to hear some of them? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is a soft shell turtle. <laughs> and this is a sea turtle. It's a sort of quacking sound. Mm. Uh, and it, it wasn't just turtles. So they also recorded uh, sounds in um, other animals that we didn't know were vocal, including this lungfish. Oh, it's like a dog. <laughs> that sounds like a dog, yeah. Um, and a tuatara, which is a kind of reptile that lives in New Zealand. <laughs> Quack. <laughs> uh, and this is my favourite one. It's a Sicilian, which is a type of limbless amphibian. <laughs> <laughs> Are we 100% rude. sure these aren't all ducks? <laughs> <laughs> I do think the Sicilian is also my favorite. <laughs> yeah. So this is a lot of previously unrecorded, I guess, vocalizations. So how come scientists hadn't noticed all these animals making noises before? Um, well, people might have heard them making sounds occasionally, but assumed that these noises were accidental or that they were defending themselves from other species, which wouldn't be considered true vocal communication. So does that mean now that we've listened to these, do we have a, a clue to what they're using them for? What are they saying to each other? Uh, we don't know exactly in, in all of these cases, but the observations they've made suggest that at least some of them are um, to do with males uh, when they're courting females or males squaring off against each other. Um, But what's really interesting about all of this study is it suggests that vocal communication is really widespread among vertebrates. And uh, by looking at the uh, family tree, they've now worked out that they think vocal communication evolved at least 400 million years ago in uh, an ancestor of all of these animals. So perhaps a lobe-finned fish. That's amazing. I I guess uh, if we've gone from thinking it's evolved loads of different times and Mm. all these different groups to to going back to that one possibly lobe-finned fish, that's incredible. (laughs) I yeah. wonder if that fish had a little quack too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, Sam. Let's take a quick break. It's competition time. Yes, you can win a £2,000 Discovery Tours voucher that can be used for any Discovery Tour, cruise or expedition in 2023. New Scientist Discovery Tours are unique science-themed holidays across the globe, and they include trips such as astronomy tours to Chile, explorations of the geology of New Zealand, and even the science of whiskey in the Scottish Hebrides. Go to newscientist.com slash tours to enter this competition. It runs until October 31st. Now we have a story about turmeric supplements, which have been growing in popularity due to their purported anti-inflammatory effects, but are now coming under scrutiny after a spate of liver injuries and some people's skin turning yellow. Rowan spoke to our reporter, Alice Klein. Turmeric has been used in Indian cooking and medicine for thousands of years, but it seems like it's become even more popular in the last few years, like this turmeric lattes, turmeric flavoured chocolate, turmeric cold pressed juices, and even turmeric lollipops. Alice, why has it become flavour of the month? I think it's been elevated to superfood status because there's been a lot of hype about its anti-inflammatory properties, which come from a compound that it contains called curcumin, and that's what gives it its yellow colour as well. There have been suggestions that the curcumin in turmeric can help lots of different inflammatory conditions, everything from arthritis to hay fever and Crohn's disease, and that's backed up by a bit of evidence, but only from a a few small studies so far. Yeah, those few small studies have taken it a long way, haven't they? I saw on the side of a bus 
uh, just last week a massive like advert saying World International Turmeric Day and uh, you know making quite big claims for it. But I guess you'd think it was it was safe given that we've used it for thousands thousands of years. But are there are reports now of it causing some injuries, liver injuries? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Turmeric seems to, I mean, you'd be forgiven for thinking that it, it cures all ills. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, it is really safe apparently when it's consumed in food form. But people are increasingly taking it in the form of supplements, um, which are obviously a bit different to food because often you've got really high doses that are mixed with other things like nanoparticles or black pepper extract that are put in there to increase the absorption of curcumin into the bloodstream. For example, apparently if you mix curcumin with black pepper, it actually increases its absorption by 30 times. Well, and that can overwhelm the liver, can it? Yeah, sometimes, apparently. Um, there's been growing reports of people getting really, really sick from taking turmeric supplements, including five new cases that I saw presented at the annual conference of the American College of Gastroenterology in North Carolina this week. Um, so, for example, there was this one case that was presented um, of a 49-year-old woman who got really bad nausea and vomiting after taking a daily turmeric supplement for three months. Uh, and this was a supplement that was mixed with that black pepper extract. Right. So she stopped taking the supplement and her symptoms got better, but then she started taking it again and she got the nausea and vomiting again. Plus the second time her skin and the whites of her eyes turned yellow. So she went to hospital and her liver was found to be so damaged that they thought she might need to have a liver transplant. Oh my God. Yeah, fortunately, she actually did recover um, after they gave her this medication that's normally used to treat paracetamol overdose and some steroids. And Mm. then she was able to leave hospital after about three weeks. Why why was she taking uh, turmeric in such high doses? Well, she was actually just taking a a recommended amount, just a a daily supplement that contained a thousand milligrams of turmeric. So it's yeah, probably just the same dose that a lot of other people are taking. Okay. And, and, but that amount of it, like, was that what literally turned her skin and eyes yellow, like the pigment in the turmeric? It wasn't actually the pigment in the turmeric. They think because her liver was so damaged that it wasn't able to perform its usual function of processing this yellow substance called bilirubin, which comes Uh, from the natural breakdown of your red blood cells. Right. So then that meant that she got jaundice, which is when bilirubin builds up in someone's blood and, and ends up making them look yellow. Okay. Um, And what about those other cases you heard about? So there were three other women aged in their 50s and 60s who also developed severe liver injuries and yellow skin after taking daily turmeric supplements for a few weeks. Then there was another woman aged 62 who actually got the same thing from drinking turmeric tea. So, I mean, if it's getting common now, the turmeric supplements, there must be more people who are taking them who, who are not getting these side effects. So, you know, What's going on here? Yeah, so turmeric supplements have actually become the fourth top-selling herbal supplement in the US. So there are a lot of people taking them and they're not all getting this sick. Right. Um, So I spoke to this liver doctor in Sydney, Ken Liu, who said it could be down to genetic differences. Basically, when you ingest a herbal supplement, it gets digested and then absorbed into your bloodstream before going to your liver for processing. And there are genetic differences in people's liver enzymes which means that some people will process the turmeric into harmless metabolites, but then others will process it into toxic metabolites that can then attack the liver. Yeah. I mean, you'd think if you started taking supplements and and started feeling really ill, you'd think, ah, perhaps I better stop. (laughs) You'd think so, but I guess some people push on. I mean, maybe they don't, they, I mean, they might be taking lots of different things and they don't know exactly what it is that's making them sick. So it's a bit of a lottery then when you take it as to uh, any kind of herbal supplement as to whether it could damage your liver. Mm. And that's why the doctors that I spoke to said that there needs to be more public awareness that just because herbal supplements come from natural sources, they do have the potential to cause harm, you know, in rare cases. So I guess the bottom line is treat herbal supplements with caution. And if you really love your turmeric, you might be better off eating it in curry form instead. Yeah, yeah, I heartily agree with that. I mean, I eat a lot of turmeric, but um, and I think I get enough of the benefits from eating it in normal food form rather than in supplements. Yeah, I mean, I think it would taste better in 
in food form than a supplement anyway. Next up, we've got an entirely new way to measure time using a quantum watch. Leia, can you tell us what is a quantum watch? Does it measure quantum time or does it measure regular time quantumly? (laughs) (laughs) It measures regular time quantumly. Um, (laughs) It's a way to measure an interval of time using quantum interference. So, you know, the famous double slit experiment, which proves that a single particle of light can go through two slits at once. And when the light yeah, I'm gets familiar. <laughs> okay, so for the listeners, when the light gets through both slits, it interferes with itself and creates this unique interference pattern. So then how is the swatch related to that? So it's a little bit different. Instead of a photon, it uses a cloud of helium atoms, all of which are in multiple quantum states at once. But like in the double slit experiment, those quantum states interact with one another and create an interference pattern. But the important thing here is that that pattern changes over time. Mm, So can they use how the pattern changes to work out how much time has passed? Exactly. And the way the pattern changes is really super predictable. So we can compare the measured pattern against simulations to know exactly how much time has passed. Okay, so I think I might understand the basics of this. Um, But I want to know, why is this useful? So with regular clocks or timers... You have to actually measure twice if you think about it. You're measuring time zero and then also the time you want to know, which is, of course, after time zero. This one is a little bit more like a stopwatch, except it starts automatically when the experiment starts. So you don't have to measure time zero. You only have to make one measurement. Okay, so it reduces the number of measurements, which reduces, I guess, one the source of error, right? Yeah, exactly. You just measure the interference pattern. You say, yep, it's been four nanoseconds since the experiment started. And every time the researchers tested it, it was completely accurate. So what would this be useful for? What what do we need to measure at the scale of four nanoseconds? (laughs) Um, It's really only helpful in a specific subset of experiments called pump probe experiments. But those experiments are really, really important in things like designing new materials. So even though it's only useful in a specific subset of work, that subset of work is really important. And can you give us a hint? What kind of new materials are we talking here? Really anything. Uh, the big one that comes to the top of my head is solar panels, but any material that you're exposing to a process and changing over time. Last up, it's our life form of the week segment. And for Halloween, Penny, you wanted to celebrate the pumpkin? Yeah, that's right. Actually, all pumpkins and squashes. I went into a bit of a deep dive on these recently for my Wild Wildlife newsletter um, because I wanted to understand more about how these, you know, quite strange, big, hard-skinned fruits, how did they come to be? Yeah, how did they? What did you find out? Well, what what surprised me was just how improbable the squashes as a sort of group are. So they're thought to have evolved from these small fruits that had these really tough skins. They were really hard to crack open as a result. And even if you managed, the insides were really bitter and quite toxic. Well, that sounds really unpleasant to eat. (laughs) But, you know, isn't the evolutionary point of fruits to be eaten and spread? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, And that's what really intrigued me, Uh, particularly this kind of fruit. uh, And it's got all these really nutritious seeds just waiting to be dispersed. And the thinking is that the main animals that ate these weird fruits are actually now extinct. So giant, big megafauna that went extinct about 11,000 years ago, these huge animals that used to roam around. There's evidence that these were what were eating them. So squash seeds have been found in the ancient dung of megalodons, for instance, uh, which is like a big elephant-like animal that doesn't exist anymore. That's cool. So why were these big animals the ideal animals for eating squashes and, you know, spreading their seeds around? Well, firstly, um, it turns out big animals can eat bitter, toxic fruits without being harmed by it. So, you know, like if a mouse ate something really toxic it can't cope with it whereas something that's you know many times the size of a mouse is is much less affected and uh it also bigger animals tend to have less genes for detecting those bitter tastes too so probably wasn't as unpleasant a meal for a megalodon 
And secondly, um, probably the reason this evolutionary relationship came to be is because these huge animals, when they existed, they roamed around and they really shaped the ecosystems that they lived in. They kind of ripped things up. They disturbed whole areas. And that would have created an environment that was actually perfect for pumpkins and squashes, which today they grow a bit like weeds in sort of disturbed environments that, that gardeners and farmers create for them. But back then, they probably relied on these huge animals ancient huge gardeners <laughs> um, <laughs> okay so now that these animals are gone how come pumpkins are still around <laughs> is that just down to us yeah, so this is the other thing that really caught my attention. So uh, pretty much around the time that most of the megafauna went extinct, which was probably due to us too, at least in part, the ancestor of pumpkins was first domesticated in Mexico. Since then, various squashes have been domesticated multiple times by people. And, you know, once people got involved, we could uh, grow the fruits. They became bigger. They started tasting a lot nicer, becoming less toxic until we have all of the different kinds of squashes we have today. And then these fruits, you know, they originally uh, evolved and were domesticated in the Americas, but they've spread all around the world now, thanks to humans and de developed into so many different kinds. So there's courgette or zucchini, who's super popular in Europe. There's uh, kabocha in Japan. There are squashes and pumpkins that have been developed and enjoyed in Africa that really sort of took over the world from there. But what I hadn't realized was that the domestication of pumpkins was so ancient, around 10,000 years ago. And we usually think of the dawn of agriculture taking place in Asia's Fertile Crescent. It's really famous. It's where things like wheat and barley were domesticated. So it's really important, I think, to know that actually similar things were happening in the Americas around the same time. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm going to be carving pumpkins this weekend for Halloween, so I'll be delighting people with all of these little facts. <laughs> um, if you want to sign up to Penny's free monthly Animals and Plants newsletter, visit newscientist.com slash wildwildlife, and we'll put a link to that in our show notes. That's all for this week. Thanks to our guests, Leah Crane, Alice Klein, Michael LePage, and Sam Wong. And thanks to you for listening. Don't forget to recommend our show to anyone who'd enjoy it and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. And for 20% off a New Scientist subscription, visit newscientist.com slash Halloween22 before Halloween. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk. 